everyone. I'm Adriana and welcome back. I am joined here again with Caitlin for Heart to Heart Astrology Podcast episode number 14 already. If you are new here, we are granddaughter and grandmother uh, joined together to share our different perspectives on the coming astrology and the energy going on in our lives. So a little bit about me, I'm based in the UK. I've been an intuitive tarot reader professionally for over four years now, approaching actually five years. And now I am a galactic astrologer and past life reader. Did you want to share a bit about you too, Caitlin? Well, um, I've been involved in metaphysics pretty much my whole life. Um, astrology came around 2018. Uh, really inspired by Molly McCord and Rick Levine. Those two uh, astrologers definitely got me interested and then found Julia, um, I think in 2022 with galactic astrology. So um, we're coming on to, I think, third year involvement for myself with, uh, and then now as a practitioner and you are as well. So feeling blessed to be part of this uh, wonderful astrology mm -hmm. that uh, shared all over the world, <laughs> being a part yeah. of it. If you have been watching us for the past few months and enjoy our videos, please uh, share our videos uh, or even our playlist with your friends so you can check out all our different videos. There's so many great tidbits of information in our past videos. Uh, please do subscribe too to our channels. I'm at Starry Sky Readings. Uh, Caitlin's at Bhakti Galactic Healing. And of course, we are also featured on the Galactic Astrology YouTube as well. So yes, please grab a cup of tea or coffee, like we always say, <laughs> and listen in to what we have to share today. Oh, very cute cup. So today we are going to be talking about some really cool stuff. Um, I'm going to briefly touch on this news about the mini moon going on that we are temporarily getting, uh, along with the solar eclipse and the alignment with fixed star Alpha Centauri. And then I'll also talk about some reflection on the Pluto retrograde being back in Capricorn for the very last time in our lifetime. <laughs> Yay. Mm. As Capricorns ourselves, we are, we're ready for that to be over. <laughs> okay, so yeah, there is going to be a mini moon, kind of exciting um, astronomy news. It's coming into Earth's orbit, so by the time you watch this, it might already be present in our sky um, around the, yeah, the 29th of September for two whole months. So the moon is getting a little friend <laughs> joining <laughs> up with, with her there. So this asteroid originates from the Arjuna asteroid belt which orbits around the sun uh, very similarly to Earth. And then it'll actually, once it completes that orbit around Earth, it goes back <laughs> to that asteroid belt. So it's very interesting um, how that's you know happening. Now, um, this is not particularly rare by any means. It actually is quite common for Earth to get you know little asteroids coming into orbit. Um, but I thought this one in particular was kind of neat since it's making a temporary home in our orbit uh, till November 25th. So that's the last day. Although it's a small asteroid, I mean, we use asteroids even in our galactic astrology. Um, and I think, you know, those ones can be very significant too. So I thought, you know, maybe there's something here. Maybe I'm reaching a little bit, but um, this does pose the question for me. What could this mean astrologically and spiritually speaking? especially with this appearing during what I feel is a very spiritual time. And the veil is thinning right now. Uh, we talked about that recently. Yes. And yeah, tensions, you know, felt throughout the world. Um, on top of this uh, transformational eclipse energy, we are in the eclipse portal. So oh, yeah. between that oh, lunar yeah. eclipse we had the last mm -hmm. time we talked about, yeah, and then this oh, solar yeah. eclipse. So I did look up the origins of the name Arjuna, which is that belt that it originates from. And this, so this is what it was given that name is Arjuna. This was an ancient prince of the Kuru kingdom located in present day 
India, and he was one of the main protagonists of this Hindu epic. And I'm, I'm sorry if I'm going to be butchering this, but the Mahabharata, but Mahabharata, I think that's that's it. That's it. Mm -hmm. the right way. Yes. Mm -hmm. Please correct me. <laughs> that's it. You got it. Second but, time. <laughs> yeah, second time got it there. But he was the third of five. Pandava brothers from the lineage of the Kuru. And there was this war and Arjuna, Arjuna was a key warrior from the Pandava side in the battle. So before the beginning of the war, his mentor Krishna, so the, the mm -hmm. deity Krishna, gave him the supreme knowledge of, it's called the Bhagavad Gita to overcome his moral dilemmas. Do you know anything about that, Caitlin? I've actually taught about it twice. Okay, there you go. Yeah, so you're <laughs> you an know expert. A lot about it. <laughs> Not an expert, but uh, mm -hmm. it's wonderful uh, spiritual teachings to learn by. Paramahansa Yogananda had a his uh, discourse about it, and I would teach from that. And Oh my gosh, his vision with it. And then he has a huge two volume set of the Bhagavad Gita, which I studied as well. So um, it's fascinating. Mm -hmm. And actually it was a movie uh, that was parallel to it. And it was based on golf, believe it or not. And how um, this uh, being came about as a, a caddy to a famous golfer. And it was, Will Smith was in this movie, but it was definitely about... Mm -hmm. Uh, the story of Arjuna. So it, it oh. was, I can't remember the name of the movie, unfortunately. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Maybe. Yeah, I might not have, I don't think Video. I've seen it. Okay. Yeah. yeah, it's a very good movie. It was very good, actually. Yeah, I thought that was really interesting, you know, that has to do with that kind of story with this asteroid here. So how interesting I think it is that this small but mighty warrior energy is coming into play during the eclipse portal, um, so again, till the end of November. So perhaps this could mean nothing, or perhaps it could act energetically as a tipping point in the collective transformational shifts to come. Any thoughts on that before we talk about the eclipse? Oh, I think we kind of did. I We addressed it a little bit. Yeah. I, I We could look at uh, this as connecting to your highest self, uh, mm -hmm. the part of us closest to source. Um, if we all could step into that, during this very important eclipse portal, we would have such a change in our world. Um, it would be almost instantaneous. Mm -hmm. Now, even if a few could do it, uh, there's always the talk about the uh, hundredth monkey. If if there's a tipping point that is considered the hundredth monkey, that if enough people would wake mm -hmm. up to the truth, who they really are, that we would have mass awakening happening. Really feel what you've shared is a lot to do with that. And I feel this whole eclipse is very much a part of that too. That oh, yeah. We need to look back with the uh, Libra South Node and really to peruse choices that we've made that aren't for the highest good. Yes, definitely. Yes. Yeah. And this eclipse has been, I don't know about you and for everyone else watching, this has been a rough one for me. I actually thought Mercury retrograde was a piece of cake <laughs> compared to the eclipse energy going on, but yeah. it's meant to be it's all happening for a reason yeah so i'm just writing it out <laughs> yeah that's the best way to go that's all Absolutely. you can do yeah so yes uh we have a uh solar eclipse on october 2nd and um it's going to start around 11 42 a.m eastern daylight time and i hope i'm getting this right i don't know if you guys have shifted your time but i think it's 15 42 um Maybe I'm wrong. Find it's out about 1642 it. for, for the UK. Uh, we're five hours. Yeah, you think you change earlier than we do or something. For some reason, they keep keeping this, I which I do not like, this Eastern Daylight Time. It's fake time as far as I'm concerned. Yeah. <laughs> a whole other video. But let me talk about the annular solar eclipse, which is not a total solar eclipse. Uh, but they are similar. And it, it, because it occurs when the moon passes between the sun and the earth, but the moon temporarily blocks the sun and casts its shadow on the earth. Um, so with an annular eclipse, it's going to create what's called a, a ring of fire. 
Okay. And where you're going to be able to see it is in South America, I think is what I've been hearing, uh, much further South than, than we are. Um, we are in Ohio, so we are above the equator, but uh, below the equator, they're going to see it. Uh, we were blessed in April to have that incredible total solar eclipse here. I'll never forget it. It was absolutely amazing. And the energies with that total solar eclipse in April are still present now as we go through this current eclipse. So, and so they're themed around relationships and how they play out in our lives. So we still have that going on. Um, and my guides keep telling me that healthy communication is the saving grace of all eclipse seasons. So this combination of the South lunar node in Libra of what we already know, so what has come and gone in his past and the North lunar node in Aries of what we are becoming are both opportunities to do some releasing of the shadowed past by bringing it fully into the light of the present moment. Um, and then we can deal with it in the ring, ring of fire. When we're talking about this, it, this eclipse season lasts a whole lot longer than just October 2nd. Um, you'll feel it for months to come. Just be aware of that because we're still feeling the one in April. Eclipses are huge. They're here to help us grow. And when we get eclipsed, it kind of takes us off of our constant patterns that we just run and run. We go on automatic all the time. And the eclipse says, hey, here, why don't you look at this? This has just happened in my life. And I have to really look at that now. I have to deal with it. And you were mentioning you're experiencing some of that. So it can take us uh, out of our automatic and put us into, here we are, we got to deal with this now. We're revising a lot of our relationships in our life. So that doesn't just mean with people, it could mean with lots of things. It can mean our relationship to our computer, our relationship to the changes happening in the world right now, um, but also with our partners and friends, family, bosses, coworkers, it can go across the way, all the way. When we reflect back on our relationships, the best question is to look at is where is the love? And of course, you know, my acronym, light on verifiable experience. So what is real? Um, so during this time, Venus could become a valuable guide through the eclipse journey, um, helping us to revisit how we maybe first fell in love. And then right now, you know, whether we fell in love with our job and then now we're complaining about our job, but we fell in love with it or we fell in love with our partner, but now we're complaining about it. I want you to see how huge this is when we say relationship. Um, but Venus is going to be in Scorpio um, during this time. And that is great to look at relationships with razor, razor sharp clarity and, and may help us real realize what's been challenging the relationship. So example, is there too much emphasis on service to others? Um, and then you feel like you're running on empty. Um, or are you the one being more selfish and taking your partner for granted? Maybe it's time to show up with some flowers just to show your appreciation of your partner, for example. <laughs> so I just thought those were good little questions. Any comment on those questions? I think flowers are always nice. <laughs> yes, I agree. <laughs> you can't go wrong. <laughs> exactly. So, well, let's look at the south node of Libra, and that's the scales and justice. So there's a tendency of self-service to others um, and, and at the expense of ourselves when we step into too much Libra. Um, and Libra's traditional home is the seventh house, which is all about what you share. So again, how well do you play with others? Um, how well do you partner, commit, caretake, and cooperate with others? Um, and again, do you care more about the other than yourself? It's out of balance when that happens. Bottom line, it's just totally out of balance. Yeah, people pleasing. Mm -hmm. Right, exactly. The goal is to bring the polarities into balance. And that's what it's all about with the nodes. No matter if we're looking at a personal chart with somebody and checking out their nodes or we're having this collective nodal uh, returns happening and all these experiences and eclipses with them. Right now, um, 
the ruler, the traditional ruler of Aries, which is in the North Node, is in watery cancer. And it's going to be for a long time. And we didn't get a chance to really talk about this, but it really changes the quality of Mars energy when there is either Cancer, Scorpio, or Pisces, the water element energies involved. Um, so it can be helpful, but it also can be harmful. It has two sides. Um, and, um, you know, it can put out the fire so then we can't get anything done. <laughs> okay, that's kind of the not so great version. Uh, but it could water down the excessive aggressiveness so that maybe hopefully collectively there isn't so much uh, revolutionary and, and wars and detrimental energies. Okay, so we have to look at it from both directions. Um, then we've got our airy Libra and its tra traditional ruler is Venus, again, in Scorpio right now. Um, so can we meet somewhere in the middle, balancing with self-care and care with others, but then also being open to receive care from others. That's the circle of care. So I'd like everybody to think about that. Are you over caring for others and ignore your self care? Then where you need to go is try to move a little bit more towards that North node of Aries and a little bit more of self care. It is not selfish to have self care ever. Oh, we're not talking being a narcissist here. That's not, not in the equation. There's no question there. Libra and how right now it's conjunct with the supergalactic center. And that is all about how we magnetize to us what we desire. So if we get in a position of we desire to be in balance in our life with this supergalactic center as uh, it's like a portal to me is how I view it we will magnetize that balance. <laughs> and, and it could be amazing in our lives to feel that balance finally, that we're not all on one side or all on the other, but we're right in the namaste, right in the middle. So Julia, our teacher, Julia Balaz, considers the supergalactic center like a hologram of truth. And it also carries multidimensional consciousness, which may be accessed through our crown chakras. So if we're open and evolved enough to receive it. So again, I feel uh, the supergalactic center is a portal that has a sea of infinite astral realms within it. In fact, I really believe that for as many beings that are that exist, there's an astral realm for every being. I don't, I, I don't feel like there's one big collective astral realm that we all just end up in. If that was the case, we'd be doing it here on earth. Right, <laughs> <Maybe>. yeah. <laughs> right, wouldn't we? So I feel for as many beings that exist, there's going to be a personal astral realm in essence. And I feel they are in the black holes. I feel they're, they have a location in that respect. This is, again, my own personal belief that when we immerse back into source, we could go back into somewhere like the super galactic center or galactic center, uh, great attractor, shapely attractor, somewhere to take a break that we actually can take a break from incarnating. I think it's good because then, you know, we can have a, a refreshing dip in peace and, and not have to be working and in earth school or in other humanoid schools, having to do something constantly. And I've been noticing um, in something an interesting pattern in the charts, the galactic charts I've been doing with quite a few of my clients. I'm seeing in the north node, south node, and ascendant that there's no conjuncts or opposites, but they have very busy mid heavens and sun sign connections with... Um, especially many outer planets, which I feel when a person has a lot of outer planet connections, they're more of an old soul. They've done many incarnations and not necessarily earth ones, but just many incarnations anywhere that we can incarnate. <laughs> so I, I kind of believe that we chose to incarnate many of us right now in this earth one to bring in our higher dimensional frequencies. And I like it to be referred to as like our fifth dimensional solar light bodies is a good way to describe it. 
Um, and this gets stored in our cellular memories to tap into at just the right moment to assist in the ascension process of Gaia. So another thing I've been noticing is the rise of solar flares, the amount of what I call the M&Ms, the multiple Ms, and the X levels that we've been having since, I think Molly McCord mentioned she tracked it back to starting really heavily around 2017. Mm. Um, yeah, not as much prior to that. And, um, but this could be an opportunity of a collective co collective activation of our 5D solar light bodies. So it's kind of like big daddy up there in the sky, grandfather, son saying, wake up, wake up. We're going to, you know, we're having these explosions there. Well, we're going to have our own light body awareness explosions <laughs> in our lives as well. You feel like with this, again, even though it's a very little asteroid, do you feel like since it is from the Arjuna asteroid belt, which is orbiting the sun, do you think it's bringing in more of that solar, that light energy to help awaken? It could. It I, could. I, I can't. Yeah, maybe, I'm not sure. This is just, you know, food for thought, but yes, yes. maybe that's contributing to that yeah. awakening, yeah. especially yeah. during this time. Maybe we could look at different levels of planetary connections like that. Mm -hmm. um, so our sun is definitely... Uh, in our solar system, the big daddy, uh, or big, I like to call uh, the sun, grandfather's sun. The south node in Libra, I do want to bring it back to that because that's super important during this solar eclipse. And again, it's um, it's in 10 degrees, which means it's still in, in the decans. It's still just starting to graduate into a little bit of maturity as we go through the decans. A dip into the South Node is like a return journey through our past experiences. And my guides keep showing me a huge rubber band being pulled way back, way back, giving us an opportunity to look at that which we no longer choose. And that way we can hopefully truly know that which we do choose by observing what was in the past and the way to deal with it is observe it but then we've got to make it present so we can get it into the light to finally heal it if we constantly just keep going back to it going back to it and not bring it into the moment we'll never heal it it'll just be this hamster on a wheel just constantly going over and over the same thing and we've all been in patterns like that well, I know you're going to address a little bit of this too, is, is correlating with Pluto taking a dip back into Capricorn until November 19th. So again, giving us yet another opportunity to clear out old patterns. So what is coming up out of the shadows of the past to be brought into the light of the present, uh, to be released, transmuted, healed, and transformed? Um, so what about myself is no longer serving me and the relationship? Am I only thinking of my own needs? Do I need to always be first? Again, that's more the Aries energy. Um, and then am I giving my power away to the other because I don't want the responsibility for my own life? This kind of describes a tendency to be codependent, a people pleaser, too indecisive. And that can roll around in the Libra energies. So are all of these limited beliefs about myself, even ancestrally, keeping me from reaching my highest potential individually, as well as in a relationship partnership? That's a great question to really reflect and ponder on. So Caitlin, you also mentioned you are seeing um, an alignment with Alpha Centauri and something with the Pleiades as well. Yes, yes. Uh, there's a very in interesting transit right now with Alpha Centauri at 29 degrees Scorpio, which is conjunct. Mm -hmm and showing up in the ascendant um, and at 27 degrees, also the power of fortune. And these are close orbs, like um, uh, zero degree, eight minutes in a sextile with Pluto and Capricorn at 29 de degree alignments. Now this is all showing up in Cleveland, Ohio. So it isn't gonna necessarily show up all around the world. So uh, I wanted to bring up just even talking about the 29th degree. I mentioned that earlier a little bit. And it's called anoretic. And it's what to watch out for when we are in collective 29 degrees 
is to take care to not make hasty decisions because we could very much fall prey to a sense of urgency or crisis level thinking, and especially even in our relationships. And again, relationships to whatever might make a mountain out of a molehill. Maybe that's a good way to describe it. So I found online, um, it's called Astrology, and I felt they had a very good definition around this. Anoretic degrees and nodes have similarities. Both of them are related with fate. There will be situations to be examined, solved, and won through. If the person does not learn what he has to learn, he will definitely experience some sort of crisis. But if he has, he will continue um, from this peak and accomplish a fateful mission. So therefore, just like the difficulties and patterns that start to resolve easier in our lives, when we fully understand and continue our path through our north nodes, the planets, cusps, and even asteroids in 29 degrees, these are indicators of where the change and the transformation will occur in our lives. So big point here is find out what house it is in for you with these uh, connections. So look for where that is. Where is that? Let me talk a little bit about Alpha Centauri itself. Um, and it's interesting because it, it could very well be the first star system that humanity will connect with. Why? Because it's our the closest system to our Earth, okay? Um, and I'm intuitively sensing that this may be a very positive connection um, for helping us to achieve balance between the opposites, meaning right now having them with us in our energy fields, assisting, um, bringing in their intuitive guidance to help us. They can be very helpful with us in that they already have experienced and gone through a lot of what we are going through. And this is true for not just Alpha Centauri, but the Pleiades, many different starseed connections or star uh, energy connections, I should stay, say. They have very often gone through it, so that's why they come to help us because they know the struggle, the challenges that they went through. And we've known, we see this with from Lyra to all the different connections that you and I have studied, Adri. So nature in Alpha Centauri is biodiverse, yet with complete interaction with all living essence in unity consciousness. So brings to mind the movie Avatar. We really saw that, the living essence that was connecting and unifying all of the beings in that Avatar movie was excellent representation of what I'm talking about. There's an inner knowing of what one does and how it affects the other on all levels. And that kind of brings up the Mayans because the Mayans, one of their um, philosophies is, was, was, you're just another one of me, that we're interconnected. You're just another one of me. And the Mayans, they just disappeared. Are they still here somewhere? Are they at a higher frequency still on earth, but we can't see them because they're at a much higher frequency? That's kind of what I believe. Alpha Centauri, um, you may already kind of carry this resonance. So what would that be? What would be an example if you have uh, a connection? Might be through ability to connect to crystals, gems, rocks, uh, even plants, animals, other humans, all of nature, <laughs> because you can see the inner essence and radiance that's vibrating out and illuminating um, from all of what I just described. So when you pick up a beautiful crystal, you can feel and sense its essence. Uh, you hug, you know, you love your animals, you, all the beautiful dogs and cats that you take care of, you walk and sit for, um, I'm sure you feel their inner essence. So mm -hmm. this is an ability that the Alpha Centaurians really have strongly. So maybe their being around us right now could come in and bring help give us that ability for those that aren't feeling things as easily. So if we're open to it, um, that's the type of way to attract it. Um, and it's interesting 
that the Pleiadians also are showing up, but in opposition to where our collective egos are heading in division. And I can feel the peace presence here to help us reach our spiritual selves, <clears throat> excuse me, through our high heart energies, which may be a great game changer in our story. So the Pleiadians may be here throughout October to influence us to see the higher heart potentials in ourselves. And by the full moon on October 17th, the 29 degree continues into a very tight orb of Venus and Scorpio. And Alpha Centauri is also in that um, connection as well again. So we shall see. We have two major beautiful star systems and the beings uh, who live within them helping us. And we will talk more too about that full moon, October 17th in our next video. So do watch out for that. Yes. Um, also, yeah, that 29 degrees is, I think, very influential as you described um, really beautifully. And I'm going to look into more on how that is affecting Pluto coming back to Capricorn. Mm -hmm. So as mentioned in our previous videos, if you have seen them or if you want to check them out, with Pluto transitioning in and out of Capricorn, we were discussing these transformative themes, um, you know, this whole year, really, we've been discussing that and we've seen the um, results from it, you know, play out. Mm -hmm. So around this alignment here. So Pluto first went into Capricorn in 2008 and remain there still more recently this year with it moving into Aquarius. But now it's made one final stop back into Capricorn during its retrograde. And actually after it finishes retrograde, it will still hang out in Capricorn before it wraps up its time there. Mm -hmm. So this to me means that things needed to be readdressed and reevaluated that we've been dealing with since 2008. I mean, think about that time. I think we spoke about this in one of our podcast videos. Um, I'll have to insert it in here somewhere, um, yeah. up here somewhere. <laughs> but yeah, think about what you've been going through since 2008. I mean, this is a big span of time and um, so many changes can happen. And even a year or two years, let alone since 2008. <laughs> mm -hmm. So especially when it comes to patterns, or habits that you needed to break or heal. Mm -hmm. This is being really intensified during the time around the eclipse. So reaching what I feel to be sort of a breaking point for shifts to start to really unfold as we enter the darker season. And with Pluto progressing out into Aquarius uh, by next month in November. So to add to the intensity of these deep healing transformations, because that's what Pluto is all about. Mm -hmm. that is what, that's what Pluto is here for. Uh, Pluto is making a sextile to Neptune in Pisces, which is also in retrograde. So that's, you know, really adding an extra layer of the intensity to it. Um, even vivid dreams or predictive type uh, dreams that also called when you uh, deja vu. <laughs> Some of you might be feeling that around this time as well. Let us know if you are or any sort of yeah more vivid dreams or things coming back up that you need to address. You know, with it being the Halloween season here, it's like things coming back to haunt us <laughs> in a way. So, um, but we don't want ghosts around here. So you know, let's clear those things and heal those things from our past that we need to. As uh, Caitlin mentioned, with it being an anoretic, or sometimes it's called a critical degree of 29 degrees, this was a rough phase for many of us to have gone through. For some, it was even karma clearing because Pluto is in Capricorn. Capricorn's ruler is Saturn, the planet of karma. So a lot, a lot of karma clearing has been happening this year. So what I would advise intuitively with the alignment at this time is to not let bad habits or patterns get the best of you. Don't fall back into those bad habits that you have uh, learned or you've been trying to break away from. These could even be ancestral things. Mm -hmm. uh, remember what you've learned and all the healing you have done these past years. 
uh, I can relate to this on a personal level. And I know some of my clients uh, who felt very similar with this energy, a lot of that dark night of the soul healing. I talk a lot about that with my own um, work that I do with people. So uh, addressing the shadow and being able to heal that and integrate that. So Neptune is conjunct fixed star sheet, which is also known as Beta Pegasi, which we did speak about in uh, just our previous video to this, if you wanna look back on more info about Beta Pegasi. Mm -hmm. So there is a very healing mermaidian energy rolling in through like waves of the ocean here with Pluto coming back to test us. So don't succumb to drowning in these things uh, that come back up for you. Instead, just look at it with a different perspective of how far you have come, how much you have outgrown the old version of you. Write it out and allow yourself to be the healed version of you. Because sometimes I think we, as people, as humans, we have a tendency to get very caught up in and very used to the dysfunctional yeah. <laughs> things. Yeah. We, we get stuck in, when we get stuck in those bad habits and patterns, that's what we get used to. And mm -hmm. instead we, we don't know or don't understand how to um, be in a healed and secure um, energy. So learn to sit comfortably with that and find your, your yeah. healed version of yourself here. Think of all the karmic cycles that have been cleared as a collective too. Because when we heal individually on an individual level, this is rippling out collectively. Yes. And we're seeing it happen. <laughs> Always. So, and we're going through it now, yeah. especially through this month of October. Going back to your mermaid um, vision, I uh, often with my clients in uh, healing energy work, um, take them down into the crystal caves and caverns that are way down deep. And that's what Pluto does. Pluto gets us to go very, very deep. So we have another opportunity for a super deep dive, get into those crystal caves and caverns and really look at what is it? And you have to look at yourself. If we constantly look out here, uh, we're seeing the mirror, but we very often don't know that. We think it's the other. The other is the problem. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, and it's when we can finally look at ourselves, because this is what we can control. This is what we can change is us. Then we empower ourselves. And so that deep thought that Pluto can bring, and really it's it's a blessing with Pluto and Capricorn coming back around. It truly is. Before mm -hmm. we we don't want to carry all this extra luggage in and exactly. into <laughs> the Pluto and Aquarius and be all weighted down where we're going into this beautiful mm -hmm. air sign and able to shift into the new. So we have to complete. And that's what I think what we've been talking about this whole video is it's a time of completion. It truly is. And isn't that goes with fall? I mean, the leaves, the falling away. Yeah. The completion it's of all time. in sync. Right. Perfect timing. Right. right. So, um, yes. And so I, I, I love what you shared there. I think it's very important. Oh, thank you. And I love what you have, too. Okay, so just to go along with everything we've just shared, I did want to pull a tarot message. I actually got two cards that came out in relation to Pluto retrograde. I wanted more specifically on that and what we need to know as a collective with Pluto retrograde. What are we reevaluating and learning here? And this it first brought this card, Five of Cups, to not cry over spilled milk, that expression. Uh, there, there's no use crying over spilled milk, right? So look at this two of cups that's behind this cat. So this is my cat tarot deck. Mm -hmm. Look at the two of cups here. So if you are focused too much on what didn't work out, you are going to miss the blessing that is actually here for you. And then that kind of puts you into this mental coffin here, four of swords. Mm -hmm. Okay, mm -hmm. so that's, that's the coffin. This is dead energy. It's immobile. It's it's dead energy. It's not going anywhere. So you need to shift your focus. You're being guided to shift your focus onto the blessing that's behind you that you may not be seeing. If yeah. you're focusing on only the bad, the negative, what didn't work out, 
the disappointments. So mm -hmm. shift your focus. And when you do, something beautiful will come of it. And how beautiful that the star card is on the bottom of the deck. The wow. star correlates to the zodiac sign of Aquarius. Beautiful. Pluto will be moving into Aquarius. Yes. So when we can clear away those things that no longer serve us, mm -hmm. our wish fulfillment comes in. I and that Aquarius that. energy brings it in. Absolutely. Awesome. Thank you all so much for being here with us and joining um, this really great video. I think we had a lot of really beautiful things to share. And please stay tuned for our next video. We're going to do a little Halloween special, the full moon we're going to be talking about in the next video, as well as um, a really cool alignment I see on Halloween. So uh, stay tuned for that. Thank you. Namaste. Thank you all. See you in the next one.